Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. All right, so another update on this app I've been using. So I did last week's episode on this camera, of course, and then off of this, and barely seven minutes into it, it stopped on its own. So the idea of using, at least so far, using this phone as my camera with that particular app, not happening. Not until they fix that. And uh, the first time I used it, uh, I said I was I was running low on memory or in storage. I had a little notification pop up, and I don't know if that's when it stopped recording or not. But I still had 13 gigs of memory left. And in the past couple of days, I did free up a ton of memory. So there's no reason, especially for those two shows, at 20 minutes and 12 minutes, or no, eight minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, tw well, it recorded 12 minutes, but I did 20 something, and this, and then this last was like what eight minute show, and I did it stopped at almost seven minutes. I'll send the feedback to the company, and say, hey, you know, unless people are just using it for short clips, which, you know, I guess they can. That's fine, but not for me. All right, let's move on to the next set of wines. Um, all right, so Llano Estacado, or as probably most of the Texans here say, Llano, or Llano, uh, because there is a um, town called Llano uh, in Texas, and that's how the Texans pronounce it, but it's the double L's is a ya sound, or a Y sound. So, but Llano Estacado, um, so this is a Texas winery. It's been for it's been around for quite a while. It was started in uh, 1976. Um, its first release is 1977. So I don't know if they used 100% Texas grapes on that. It's not unusual for wineries when they first start up the first because it takes at least three years for your own vines to produce anything worth using to make wine with, as far as grapes. Um, it's usually a three to five year process for those vines, but most young wineries, if they need the cash flow immediately, they just get, they buy grapes or and or juice from other wineries, hopefully within their own state, but sometimes they buy them from elsewhere. And that's nationwide, that's not just a Texas thing. All right, so um, anyway, but they released it, their first release in 1977, um, and they were a group of investors, including a Texas Tech Horticulturalist, uh, horticulturist, and chemist who firmly believed West Texas held the potential to become a source of quality wine grapes. Um, let's see here. He had to help persuade local farmers to experiment um, because, honestly, you know, West Texas has a lot of agriculture and they irrigate and all that. It doesn't get a lot of rain, but they can irrigate. But you know, crops like cotton or corn or wheat use a lot more water than grapes do. So they start kind of doing the math. Okay, I spend a lot less money on water. I get this much per acre or tonnage or whatever for grapes versus using a whole bunch of water and the expense of that. And I only get this much for those products. So, all right, um, in, uh, in 1986, um, they were they uh, went to the San Francisco Fairs International Wine Competition and got a double gold medal for their 1984 Chardonnay. Um, and they continue to produce or increase their production quality. Um, blah blah blah. And then I'm trying to get to by '93, they had increased production to 45,000 cases of wine. 
um, and doing business outside of Texas, including three European markets, Japan and Russia. Very impressive. Um, then they brought in Greg Bruni to relocate to Lubbock from California. He's the winemaker. Uh, took over the winemaking and production responsibilities as a VP. Three months later, um, they brought in, it just says, oh, uh, Hyman, who I didn't mention before. And honestly, I don't think he's mentioned in the entire thing. Hyman might have been the person who was who started the whole thing. Anyway, he brought in another gentleman with the last name of Hyman, but spelt differently, uh, Mark Hyman, to become VP of Sales and Marketing. And um, blah, blah, blah. So they've been doing their thing ever since then. All right, so let's get into the wines here. The first wine is the 1836. Um, and I know I grew up in Texas, but... Uh, and every Texas, every everybody who goes to school in Texas, and in the third grade, um, I mean third grade, eighth grade, goes through Texas history. Um, but yes, March second, uh, eighteen thirty six is when the Republic of Texas was founded, and uh, then it ended in February nineteenth, eighteen forty six. Uh, that's when I believe, as we get to that. It became a state. So uh, 10 years, we were our own country. So it really is like a whole nother country when you um, see those ads for tourism. All right, so 1836 white, uh, made with the intent uh, for 20 bucks, non-vintage. Uh, is made with the intent of showing the best of what Texas has to offer, a blend of Roussan and Viognier. Um, blah, blah, blah. And that's all I got other than just regular. Oh, it's not non-vintage. Why did I say that? 2014. It's just my notes didn't say a vintage. 2014. I'm like, the, the, both these have vintages. All right. So let's check out the wine. All right. How you doing? Good enough. Oh, why haven't I been recording here in the kitchen table instead of the dining room table with the green screen? Oh, that has to do with the, ooh, has to do with the hailstorm in San Antonio. That's now like two months ago, it feels like, maybe not quite as long. Um, the house is in a little bit of disarray. The other reason why we haven't done any episodes because my normal set isn't ready and I didn't, I, I was hoping to be ready sooner, but right now, it, there's a bunch of stuff there. So we still have more work to do on the house from the hail damage. All right. Okay, I get uh, tropical fruits, melon, cantaloupe, cantaloupe rind. I get cantaloupe. I, I like to use cantaloupe rind as, a, um, uh, as an aroma because I, I, I just, I key into that aroma and I seem like to be the only one that ever says cantaloupe brine. So maybe I, I call cantaloupe brine, somebody else calls it something else, but it really smells like cantaloupe brine. Um, maybe apricot. I know I'm not allowed to use maybe, but you know, there's another it's another fruit, almost a savory type of fruit to it. Nectarine, apricot, I know that's maybe not savory, but it's another aroma, nectarine, apricot, you know, stone fruits. A little bit of floral, not a whole lot. And a, um, an apparent creaminess to it. On the palate, 
I'm getting honey, which they also say you're going to get, but I do get it. They say aromas of honey, mango, chamomile, and hint of citrus peel. Well, I definitely get that, that honeyed bit of honey uh, flavor. Um, I don't get cantaloupe rind, but I do get the tropical fruits. Um, I'm going to guess mango in there. I don't I eat a lot of mango, so maybe that's what I'm getting from, from other stuff. Um, and I've never had chamomile that I know. I mean, I, I'm sure I've had a chamomile tea, so I guess I've had chamomile, but I, I, I have no clue what that tastes like. I, I don't remember. It's been so long. But they do mention it's, it's rich in texture, which I would say, yes, there, there's, a, there's a body to it, a, a weight to it. Um, it's not a thin, highly acidic white wine, uh, which nothing wrong with them. But it's definitely got some, it's got good aroma. It's a, it's a fairly moderate, moderate intensity on the nose. Maybe a medium, no, more of a medium plus. I wouldn't call it full bodied, but it's definitely medium bodied. Um, it's very good. It's 20 bucks. You chill it a little bit. Just like the last, just like the last couple episodes of white wines or the rosé. It's so the wines you can easily sit back and drink on a porch on a hot summer's day. Or a nice breezy spring or fall day. These would be great. And this also has, I mean, it's a Roussan Viognier blend. I love that blend. I love Viognier. Um, this is also a good holiday wine. You get some, you get some uh, dishes that have a little bit of oomph to it. This wine will hold up to it. Excellent wine. Let's move on to the next one. I want to take too much time. All right. So this is the 2013 uh, Yano Cellar Reserve Chardonnay, also for twenty dollars. And all right, so it's cold. Uh, so the juice was cold fermented in stainless steel tanks before the fresh wine spent one hundred five days in neutral French oak barrels. Okay, and that's all the technical details on this wine. It's really cool to do the white wines in the, in the clear bottles because then you can see the, the gas going in there. That was easier to take out. I really want to know how. I guess my guess is when the person bent the thing, they did it like that instead of like that. That's okay. They now know how to use it or how not to use it. All right, so on the nose, good intensity on, on the nose. A tropical fruit character. I, I mean, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to look at what they say. Well, this is tropical fruit and spice from Bartlett Pears. I remember when I did this the first time on the failed recording. Um, I don't remember really getting pears out of it. And as far as spice, maybe, I, again, there's that maybe word, but you know, okay, if you get spice and I don't, it's not the end of the world. But it's, it's tropical fruit, again, some cantaloupe. Um, I don't really get any floral. There's a, I don't want to call it a sour milk because that, that's bad, right? But there's a um, a creaminess to it. In not a bad way. All right, let's check it out. It's got good body to it. There is a, a coating of the mouth. Um, I'm going to assume it has gone through some type of malolactic fermentation. Um, I don't know if it's 100%. Partial. My feeling is probably a partial because I do feel like I get some 
apple aromas, or, or not apples, but apple flavor, golden apple, along with, I guess, the pear. So I would imagine there's at least some malic acid in there. But it's definitely a rich Chardonnay. If I was tasting this in a blind, I would call it a probably a California Chardonnay. It's also, and I, I remember this from last time, though when I first smelt it and when I tasted it the last time, there was this somewhat overpowering popcorn, not buttered popcorn, but popcorn aroma and flavor. Right now, I kind of get that, but what I was really getting, I think, was this kind of smokiness to it. And it kind of reminded me of popcorn that maybe got slightly burnt, okay? I really get it now on, on, on the palate. So, I mean, this totally would be like, well, it's probably a California Chardonnay. If that's what they're going for, cool. If that's not what they're going for, well, that's what I'm getting. Um, you know, the problem is, like most of the states that make wine, I don't think there's necessarily a style that's classic yet for anything other than California, Oregon, depending on the wine, Washington, depending on the wine, and then maybe New York, again, depending on what wine it is. If you're looking for a Chardonnay that has some elements of California Chardonnay, um, that's from Texas, that's good quality for 20 bucks retail, not gonna go wrong with this. It's gonna be just as good as any other $20 Chardonnay from California. But then again, the way this tastes, that range can go down as low as 12-ish dollars, upwards of just pick your price above $20. So there's lots of wines in that range from California that have similar flavor profiles and aromas. But it's a good wine, um, not gonna go wrong with it. So this is, you know, this is an example of a lot of debate in the Texas wine community as to what grapes you should be growing in Texas. Well, first of all, Texas is a big state. It is like a whole other country. It's, when you, you, you superimpose it on a map of Europe, basically covers France, okay? Um, think about it, France has multiple areas, multiple climates, and a bunch of different grapes. But um, there's definitely debate that, you know, the classic French varieties of Chardonnay, um, Cabernet, and Merlot, uh, and Pinot Noir are not suited towards Texas. And, sorry, I tend to agree with that. It just kind of depends on site that you're doing. And Chardonnay is really one of those grapes that can grow everywhere. So there is no place you can't do Chardonnay. All right, that's gonna do it. If you like this type of style of Chardonnay, if you, and if you like the way I described the 1836, buy them. They are good wines. All right, so um, that's gonna do it for this episode. Um, as always, thank you for stopping by. Leave comments below at YouTube or on the website. I'll have a link to uh, Yano's uh, website on my website. Uh, leave me a five star rating in iTunes. That's very helpful. Um, you can send me a friend request and in a couple months I will look at those friend requests and accept them. Um, and depending on which, you know, which social media aspect or whatever uh, social media uh, app or website or whatever um, that you did that on, send me a few duckers via PayPal. That would be outstanding. And I, I didn't mention the first two episodes, but if you really got to get a hold of me, mark at 1337wine.com. You can email me uh, and I will get the email or send me a con use the contact form on the website. All right, it's going to wrap it up. I just want to thank everyone for uh, checking it out and we'll see everyone again next time.